thanks for thanks for joining me in the studio, B. Absolutely, always good to be here. Man, hey, um, Thursday comes quick. I know it does, doesn't it? Yes, it does, <laughs> man. Yes, it does, man. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about a section that um you have in your book by Rent and Profit that I really enjoyed. Um, it's uh, seven keys to becoming a successful landlord. And um, as I've been traveling with you and as I've been working with you, man, this this term landlord is is kind of morphed into there, there's more than just the landlord. Of course. And so before we get into the seven keys, um, I'd love for you to tell me more about, you know, what are other areas of uh, property management, real estate, right. rental investing that are available? And then we're going to go through the seven keys to, to being successful in those in those areas. So right. be, break it down, man. So, yeah, there's a little backstory to, uh, like everything, there's a backstory to that whole, you know, to buy it, rent, and profit, yeah. and the, ra- the way I, I, uh, I wrote it. Um, you know, uh, Simon & Schuster, you know, they had all their attorneys in the room, so, you know, you got a picture, right, picture right. of the setting. It's November, okay. uh, flying to New York. Um, you know, I've got my agent, uh, Big Leon Associates, uh, as my literary agent at the time, um, I'm in there. They set up a meeting with Simon and Schuster's first, first, second meeting. Right. Actually, the first meeting was with like I think Random House or something like that. Right. Okay. A smaller publisher, really cool dude. We met him at a coffee shop. You know, he came out. You know, did his pitch. You know, and I I had no prior experience, so I'm like, okay, this is this cool, cool. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you, appreciate it. And he's like, all right, now we're gonna go see Simon and Schuster. So now. Okay. We take well. We walk. It's Christmas time, yeah. New York, November. It's not Christmas time, but it's getting ready for the uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day prayer. Everything's decorated. It's beautiful, right? Um, you know, I think it's either close to my birthday or it's on on the day of my birthday. So I'm in New York at the time. You know, we walk with my agent's name was David at Dan or D- Dave at the time. So I walk with Dan, Dave, over to uh, to um, Park Avenue. Yeah, uh, and enter into Simon Schuster. And I think and there's another story. I'm not gonna get too far with these <laughs> stories, but I mean, in the in the lobby I, was Joel Osteen. Wow. Okay. Uh, didn't know who he was at the time. Just right, kind of right. you know, a little bit about him, you know, just a little bit about him, you know. I had you know seeing him on maybe on social media a little bit. Social media wasn't really that big, so you know, it's really cool dude. Now, hey, how you doing? You know, then we go into the meeting room. Anyway, tons of attorneys, just me, my agent, my agent. I kind of felt like was out of his element, you know, at Simon Schuster. Right. Right. Um, and he's just trying to get a deal done. I, I can't knock him, but I'm looking at the situation. And uh, and for me, I always, you know, go in negotiating. I'm always looking at how other people get paid first. Okay. Because um, then I can know your motivation. And then, you know, trying to really figure, ask questions, figure out their angle. So uh took my notes, but after I went home, I kind of figured, you know, hey, listen, I need to kind of figure out how to make multiple books. Because I'm thinking at the time, you get rich by having multiple books out there. Right. So I'm like, oh, man, you know, I need to create this book. It needs to be tight because they had my operations manual. Okay. That's why they um, that's why they wanted to take the meeting. And these guys were bullish. They were like, I had like four other meetings. Okay. And at the time, scheduled with, right. with them all over New York, you know, with this dude. Um, but Simon Schuster was like, hey, listen, we're, you know, don't worry about the time. Right. Because uh, Dan mentioned, well, we have other meetings. And he looked. Dude looked at Dan at the head of the table at Simon Schuster and was like, "Nah, well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna lock this guy up today. Okay. You, you okay. know, when, when 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 we're done, he's gonna choose Simon Schuster. We're pretty much, you know, ninety percent, you know, confident. Right, right. I'm like, okay, that's a bold move, but <laughs> you know, money talks at the time. You know, I don't know anything about the publishing world. You know, so at my my only motivation at this time was money. Right. How much you gonna pay me? So. um, you know, I'm looking at this Park Avenue office. I'm like, well, you know, I'm doing the math. One attorney, two attorney, three attorney. I mean, I'm doing 90000 120 for that. I'm doing the math. I'm like, okay, right, these right. guys can afford to, you know, owned by CBS. So I'm like, okay. Um, go back home, do my homework, and realize, you know, I, they had my manual. And I was like, okay, you know, you know, I don't want to necessarily give every bit of information. I don't want to be able to have enough for, for a series of books. Right, um, okay. And, you know... Of course, no understanding my mentality then, and you know, for the viewers that are watching, and they're like, "Oh, but you don't have a ton of books, but you only have the landlord entrepreneur," and and you know, you got to remember, years later, I would end up getting sick. You know what I mean? So you know, a lot of things, you know, you know, came to a drastic halt. So, um, 
But at the time when I wrote, I was like, you know, I'm just going to touch and do a 10,000 square foot view. But what I'm going to do is create a procedures manual that anyone can be successful in this business, um, you know, with these guidelines. But I'm not going to drill too far. I'm not going to get too granular. Okay. So, you know, terms like landlord, asset manager, you know, all the various different paths you can get to owning your own apartment complex. I kept it real simple. Right. So I just spoke about the landlord at the time. Um, didn't really speak about, you know, because at that time I was an asset man. I mean, a, 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 a property manager and, uh, and just moved into the uh, acquisition management team, you know, still kind of quasi working in the multifamily space. Um, didn't 100 percent, you know, step out on my own at this time. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, you know, I could easily mention asset management, asset management analysts, all the, the, you know, th these these heavy terms, you know, but I chose to kind of leave that out and keep it really simplified and give a procedures manual to the masses. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was kind of my focus. So that's why you hear a lot of the landlord, you know, uh, the terminology, because I think Simon Schuster really loved that. They really thought that the landlord, there are more landlords than there are private equity firms. Correct. You know, there's more, more smaller owner operators than there are anything else. Agreed. And so... Um, you know, so that that was, you know, the reason why I decided to kind of just really focus on on those individuals. Syndications weren't big at the time. Right. OK. Um, if not, you know, not existent. You know, a lot of people weren't syndicating. Uh, a lot of people were putting deals together, but not necessarily, you know, you know, with the rules that we have in place now with, the, you know, the SEC guidelines. But uh, so now it's a little bit more sophisticated. So now we, you know, we want to kind of open up, you know, um, the various different paths speak of speak to you know the asset manager speak to the asset management analyst right uh, a lot of people don't know you know who and what that is you know speak to a portfolio manager and really kind of show how all these paths can kind of lead to, to to rome which is owning and operating a uh uh their own apartment building agreed man i i 100 I, I i came and i started to uh, work with you b because i wanted to become a landlord and then working alongside you, I start seeing all these other opportunities. I'm like, wait a second, asset management, syndication, mm -hmm. the whole nine. And uh, we got to keep in mind that the American dream is not necessarily owning a home anymore. And so, you know, there's all these people renting, all this, all these different experiences. And so, yeah, that need for asset management mm -hmm. is becoming greater. Um, the also the, the um, syndication, you know, mm -hmm. putting stuff like that together is, is definitely becoming more and more popular. Um, so I wanted you to open that up, you know, as we talk about, you know, different keys to becoming successful with managing rental property. Um, so, yeah, you know, like you said, you know, there's definitely a lot more assets to that as well. So let's go back to uh, the seven keys of actually becoming successful in, you know, being an asset manager or a landlord if you're a single family operator. Um, you know, so in the book, you, you said um, one of the first keys is to get educated. Right. Why, why is that important? Uh, I mean, I, you know, you, you would think that's an obvious question, right? Right. Get educated. Uh, but as I started, you know, in the beginning speaking uh, at these RIA groups and inter introducing my product, my services, uh, I realized that people were buying and operating that had no clue what they were doing. So, you know, I took, I took, uh, I took for granted how educated I, and trained I was in the right, multifamily right. industry, you know, you know, uh, taking my cam, then becoming a cam instructor, you know, having the toolage and the guidance of someone like Nina Gang, the former president of the BAA, um, Bay Area Apartment Association. You know, I, um, you know, I, I kind of took for granted how educated and trained I was in each of these processes and these systems as you moved up from leasing agent to, uh, assistant manager to manager, you know, the training that you receive, you know, right. you, should, you just take for granted. And then you step into a space like into the RIA groups outside the multifamily space and you start introducing yourself and talking to these groups of individual um, owner operators and you realize how some of them are out there buying property and they have no clue, you know, and you seen you see the likes of a lot, uh, the likes of this as well. And, you know, as we started really then switching our, 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 our operations to training um, a lot of uh, realtors, right? you know, they go from selling homes to now calling themselves property managers. And then we teach them and educate them. We realize how much they don't know, but yet they have a portfolio of 50 single family rentals or a small apartment building, but can't even recite the seven protected classes under the fair housing law. Correct. You're like, what the, 
you're managing these people's assets and you know, making put, money and making money and putting these people at risk and you have no clue what it is you're doing. So, you know, you, 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 you sometimes you, if depending on, you know, where you're coming from, you, you, you either lose sight or you, or you take for granted, you know, how important training and education really is as you're Correct. building a business. And, and essentially, you know, I noticed a trend that a lot of these owner operators, not all of them, but a lot of them were, never really approach their business, this, this the owning and operating rental property as a business, you know, side hustle, um, you know, uh, you know, a landlord, I don't know, whatever they call themselves, they never really <laughs> approach it like a business, no business plans in place, no P and L's, no, you know, never, no, no operating systems. So here comes this kid years ago, you know, wrote this procedures manual and, and introduced an opportunity, seen a need in the pl- marketplace introduced an opportunity to say, hey, look, buy my manual for $250 and you got everything you need to operate your rental properties. How I how I manage 2,000 units is how you're going to manage your two single family or your two duplexes. Correct. You know what I mean? I'm going to systemize everything. So, bam, here it is in a three-ring binder and I was selling out of the trunk of my car and that's kind of really how, how it all kind of took off. But I felt like and seen, and even today, mm-hmm. the lack of training and education and quality education that's out there. You know, we see that now, even in this space with, you know, everyone talking about syndication, uh, but not everyone, everyone's talking underwriting right. and evaluating markets, but no one's really talking um, what it takes to operate the property day to day. So let me, let me back up on that, man. So in your opinion, when you speak to all these folks who are managing these assets, what do you feel is missing in their education? That's a good question. That I couldn't answer mm-hmm. because that's something that you would have to speak to the in, the individual. Right. You know, uh, if you're consulting with a housing authority like we've done. Right. Uh, you know, you, you pinpoint and then you go by and you visit the property. Um, you know, if, if it's a private equity firm like I've, you know, uh, we've done um, and we have video and YouTube video yep. on, you know, I have to go and visit the property. I've right. got to visit the management, you know. Uh, you know, in many different different cases, it's you know I have to see how things are done at the operational level, okay. and then I make my assessment. You know I want to see you know first thing I do when I step on site, I want to see you know um, the interaction between leasing and and prospect tenants, right. making sure that's done right. I want to be able to to, to review um, you know um, the, the the knowledge. It always starts with the fair housing laws with me. Okay. So I want to see if the leasing agents understand and grasp fair housing law. Cause there's two places that I've always known that, you know, lawsuits happen is either fair housing or security deposit, right. You know, uh, uh claims, um, or disputes. So when I step foot, I want to see how the leasing agent interacts with prospect tenants and, 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 and as well as the current tenant, uh, base, um, I look at management, look at their systems, okay. uh, reporting systems. I want to see how they're reporting on a weekly basis to the asset manager. Um, I'm always then looking at the rent roll. I want to see right. delinquency. So I, you know, I want to see how long, you know, certain delinquencies are staying on the books. Are they, you know, Johnny on the spot person is late three days goes out. You know, they don't answer the three day. No one's paid, you know, uh, file sent to the eviction attorney, eviction attorney process is going. Who's staying on top of that? You know, until the individual is all, all already, you know, has been removed. Okay. Then what's the process for getting the unit re-ready? Who determines market rent? So, you know, it's just you, you start going down that rabbit hole. And I, but I know instinctively what I need to ask, what I need to be looking for. So I might be looking and asking for things simultaneously. If you watch those videos, you'll see I'm looking at the rent roll. And I got my older brother, Leroy, big shout out to Leroy. <laughs> I'm like, you focus on the maintenance tickets. And I had Carlos which back then was my understudy, big shout out to Carlos Ares, who owns Argo Group. You know, um, so Carlos, I say, Carlos, you focus on the delinquencies, all the tenants who are paying late. Right. You know, any tenants that have any kind of seven-day notices within the last three to four months, you know, in their file disturbance notices, things like that. Um, I want you to identify that. You know, Ricky at the time was my personal assistant. I had her on a different project. I want you to look at the leases, who's coming up for renewals, right. where the market rents are. So everybody's, you know, a forensic audit on that. Right. Everyone's doing something, you know. So, but for me, you know, it's, it's just understanding that, um, you know, what to look for and how to uh, how to really assess that. And 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 uh, you know, you know, it's uh, you know, it's you know, those those are the, I mean, those are the things that are. Uh, right. 
And I know I kind of gotten off 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 the path with the education, but for me, that's that's it all. You know, that's it, it revolves around the training, just understanding that. You know um, what it takes to to run these properties from an operational standpoint is so important in the education that comes along with it, and understanding do the, are these are the, it, the the teams are they trained? Yeah, absolutely. Is the staff you know educated? And are they trained? Because it really just it that's what it boils down to is are these staffs are these are these property management teams are they well trained? Correct. You know I see it in the multifamily industry because you know we drill training on a on a week quarterly basis. Right. You don't see that, you know, with a lot of private equity firms, a lot of startup firms. You know, it's like, oh, just hand the property management off to a third party property management company. But you know, how well trained are they? How well how well versed are they? Uh, you don't know, but you see that. So you see the gap. So when you're saying, you know, how do I assess that? It's like we don't know what what that individual needs. I don't know what that individual property needs until I visited it with the property manager and I seen them interact right. with that property. Then I'm able to make an assessment on what I feel they need and where I, where their where their shortcomings are, and then and then uh, evaluate the situation. And you know, for sometimes it, it you know uh, it, it results in you know training the staff, and sometimes unfortunately it results in like we what happened with that 133 unit in Kissimmee. Right. It results in me just saying I can do bad all by myself, right? And letting everybody go. That makes and sense. Firing that, everyone. So education obviously is extremely important. Um, and so you can see there's a vast array of areas where we need to learn and, and verse ourselves in, you know, the art of property management and managing these assets. Um, another one that you listed down was uh, always be professional. Mm -hmm. Why, why is that an important key uh, to being successful and managing assets? Uh, you know, uh, professionalism and, and, you know, again, drilling down mm -hmm. professionalism just as being a master of your craft too. You know, I think that's what I was leaning more towards when I wrote the book right. was this understanding, you know, is, 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 is professionalism. And I don't care, you know, if it's a suit and tie or, you know, you're coming in with t-shirts, jeans, right. and a pair of Chuck Taylors. Um, you know, the professionalism is just, you know, for me is always making sure that you master your craft um, and that you're a student of the game mm -hmm. um, and that you, that, that, you know, and you, know, you slow down and you take time to actually learn. I, I notice and see trends, and you know, some people may not equate this to professionalism. So, you know, some people may not, you know, draw those, you know, those those distinctions or, or connect those dots. But you know, I've I've encountered, you know, individuals that have tried to come into our circle, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm sure you you kind of know who I may be referring to. Various different individuals. You know, and they're they're, they're good people, yep. but uh, you feel like they try to rush the process. Right. You know, they 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 want to rush the process of being a thought leader, right? And without putting in some work, you know. So a lot of people question, why do you have these people when you meet with them, watering your plants, right? At Park Plaza and doing work orders and following you with you know through the day to day process, is you know you weed them out because you want you want to see who's really willing to put the work, and it may look stupid. But is it stupid? Because the people, if you notice a trend, and I'm not tooting my own horn, I'm just right. this is just real talk. Right. If you notice the people who put the work in and came in three days a week, watered the plants at Park Plaza, eventually got into working with the PLs and working on the budget right. with me and the marketing, those individuals that came in and put the grind in actually do have what now? They own their own properties. They own their own properties now. Correct. Did they own property before I, I, they did that with Absolutely me? Absolutely not. No. no. So, but the ones who didn't stay, they didn't make it through that process. They abandoned the process. They may not want to come out and water plants and 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 go through work orders and 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 just do what was considered meaningless work. Correct. They didn't stay. Ask yourself. We know a lot of them. Do they own anything right now? Not at all. They rushed the process. They wanted to be a thought leader, but you'll see some of them out there on social media putting themselves out there as as if you know they they're a thought leader or have this ha have have you know mastered the game, but haven't you know where 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 are your hours logged in right. you know to actually you know to actually putting in the work, and so that's professionalism to me is just making sure that because social media can make us all look like geniuses. Correct. I mean, you got filters on those cameras. Of course. You can filter certain things. You can edit certain things. You can stand in front of anyone's car 
That's true. You can sit in anyone's plane for 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 a swipe of your credit card for 15, 20 minutes and snap pictures like Ex- you're exactly. You're in the plane, you know, you do one of these way well, back and you know, you're on your phone <laughs> checking your voice messages, you know, on, on the plane and you know, you know, hit them with the various different poses and you know, get out the car, there's a Rolls Royce there. You can you you can do anything. Exactly. You know, so the question is is, you know, you know, how do you get through all that white noise? And for me, Getting through the white noise is the reason why I like doing podcasts and really not preparing for them. Is ask any questions, you know, like the one I did the other day. Yep. It's because professionalism, authenticity comes through through the stories you share and through your your actual knowledge of, uh, of of experience. And that's why I wanted to give these people first. I wanted to have them water the plants because I wanted to see if they would stay and be committed. Right. Then I started having them do tasks, property management tasks, and then their knowledge grew. And then what happened? Their confidence grew. True. Now, these individuals have the confidence and the professionalism to be able to, if they chose, get in front of a camera, talk about certain various different things, um, you know, lead meetup groups, organizations, uh, you know, uh, provide training, you know, but they have the experience. And, right. you know, there's, you know, there's there's a ton of great uh, thought leaders out there that they have that experience. For um, some of the people who are listening who are looking to acquire their own assets, um, what are some of the types of unprofessionalism you've also seen like on the property? Like as, as someone who's been managing properties, when you've taken over properties, what are some of the things that you've seen that have been unprofessional in your opinion? Uh, unprofessional is it not, uh, unprofessional and dangerous, not understanding, you know, the law, right. Not understanding fair housing law, race, color, religion, sex, national origin, familial status, persons with disability, and then whatever protected classes each of those municipalities may have, um, not having that keen understanding because now you're leasing apartments and you're speaking and you're leasing and you're, you know, on, you're speaking on behalf of ownership, speaking on behalf of yourself on ownership, the management company, everyone, but you know, you don't have a strong grasp of the fair housing law and you violate. So for me, just really not being a student or being trained is 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 is, is a level of un, unprofessionalism, you know, that I cannot uh, condone. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, and there's levels, you know, uh, you know, uh, unprofessionalism, you know, how you look, how you dress, mm-hmm. uh, at the onsite level. Right. I don't want to say I've, I've stepped on site with, 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 with a few housing authorities and you, you yes. got it on video. Yep. And I'm, if I can't tell the difference between the prospect tenants or the tenants and the staff, that's a problem. That's, that's a level of unprofessionalism. I don't want you dressing and coming to work in your in your sandals or shirt untucked, you know, and you're representing the property, you're representing management, you're representing ownership. So if I can't tell the difference between leasing and, and the tenants, that's a problem. So, um, you know, and I, I can go on and on, but, right. you know, th- those are some of the, the things. And then at the at the, you know, the reporting level from the property manager, how they interact with staff at the on site level, mm-hmm. you know, uh, are they making sure that that training and things are done on a on a on a weekly basis, and then asset management from the property manager now reporting to the asset manager, uh, you know what is that? How's the asset manager who's really kind of setting the dashboard, right. creating the management plan, and along with asset management analysts and portfolio manager creating the overall like the guiding the ship. You know what level? How is the education? How is the training? You know what is what is that relationship um, like? You know uh, as we move our way up. You know and you know those are levels of unprofessionalism when asset managers just asking for reports on a quarterly or weekly basis, but really not too involved with the growth of the of the team. Okay. You know. So. All right. So yeah, we're drilling down, man. Uh, So getting educated, being professional. Obviously, there's lots of ways that people have. You know, these are things that will help you to be successful as a, as a landlord or as an asset manager. Um, then another one that you have in the book is developing effective systems. So, B, could you tell me a little bit more about how systems have um, changed your overall operations wow. and, um, you know, where, where you may be taking over a property that had bad systems and what, you know, how yeah. you've been able to save that? Um, and, and, and really, it can, you know, I can, I can, I can, you can, you can. You can save a lot of people, man. You can save anyone, any system, any business with the right type of system. Okay. Um, I can hide mistakes. I can hide inefficiencies, yep. flaws yep. through systems. 
Um, you know, so systems, and let's just back up and kind of talk about what systems are. So systems are a system. There's two types of systems okay. when you step into a property management or a, a ownership of apartment building. Right. You want to set up hard systems and soft systems. Hard systems are your procedures, manuals, um, you know, that are basically, you know, the Bible on how the property should be ran and operated. Okay. And that might change from property to property. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, you're 80, 90% of the procedures manual is going to be just the same, but you know, maybe 15, 20% is going to change based on the demographics of your prospect tenant or the location of the property. Just keep that in mind. Those procedures manuals identify the work that needs to be done. Then tells the user how to go about performing that work. Right. Okay. To provide consistency. Then when you have consistency, you have profitability. Okay. That's how you create the consistency and the profitability within your business. Soft systems are then like the property management software, building them, yep. um, you know, that you would use to be able to kind of really run it to keep the, the, the machine going. But, you know, and they both have to work, you know, hand in hand. But those are the two types of systems that you that you have to set up. Um, and again, you know, the, 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 the dynamic aspect of that is understanding that, you um, you know, those systems do change. Qualifying criteria changes from zip code to zip code to zip code based on the property and then the who the property's um, prospect tenant is. So, you know, understanding that, you know, and, 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 and you know, being well-versed in that, you know, I, I was in the multifamily industry. I've, right. I've managed stuff in the hood and I've managed stuff on Class A, you know, uh, property in, in, in higher-end neighborhoods. So, Core systems are the same, but, you know, qualifying criteria is much different. Right. Rules and regulations are going to change. So just understanding what systems are and, and how to implement those systems is, is really key because, uh, you know, really that's, that's, that's the heartbeat of the, uh, of, uh, of the operation is just making sure that staff understands that. And then when, you know, um, in, when they're, when they're um, you know, when they're deviating from that, you can tell. It's going to show. It's going to show in the rent roll. Exactly. The delinquencies. It's going to show and suffer. The net operating income is going to suffer. And if the net operating income suffers, then obviously we know the value suffers. Correct. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I thank you for breaking all this down, B, because, you know, it's so important, man, as people acquire their first, you know, multifamily investment. If you don't have these things in place, then, you know, a lot of this stuff can fall apart. You know, absolutely we really want to make sure that you're successful. Um, so uh, another thing that you talked about in, um, in your book was uh, building a team. Why is it important to build a team? What type of people should we have on our team as, as someone who's managing properties, managing assets, you know, so on and so forth? Yeah, that's, a, that's another good question and a backstory. You know, teams are really important to anything that you do. But yep. for me personally, you know, teams have always been important because, um, you know, I've always, you know, I'm not, you know, I've always said if you're the smartest person on your team, then your team is in trouble. Mm. And so building a team is really important. And, uh, it's easier said than done. You know, people talk about you know building a team, but really don't know how to run a team. You see this at high levels of leadership. You know, um, the leader, you know, Chavis, it's got my name on it. Yep. You know, and, and you know, just in in the dynamics and you know of our relationship. You know, I'm, I don't necessarily one thousand percent always agree on maybe the direction you may you may change or certain things you may do within the brand, but for me. It's that's that's leadership. That's team Correct. is, you know, I, you know, I've played on plenty of teams where guys, you know, it's, it's there's there's certain levels of, hey, look, you know, you, 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 you know, if if, if that's what you're going to do is focus on controlling that, then, you know, you're going to, you know, you stick to what you do best. So right. if I have to lose 30 percent, 20 percent of, you know, where maybe where I feel like something should go mm -hmm. in order to uh, to be more of a effective overall leader to, to guide the ship and move the ship forward. Cause right. that's what we're all about is moving towards goals with, with this business. Um, then, you know, you have to understand how to give up certain, you know, aspects of, 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 of control. Mm -hmm. uh, leadership is about sowing seeds and other others, um, putting the right people around you. You know, I don't, I'm, I'm not a strong advocate of, yes, I take all these courses and training and you'll find me online taking Harvard classes on finance. Of course, I have to. I have to stay abreast of this stuff. I have to bone up. I have to. I also have to set an example for others that come in behind me that that education and training and, and always constantly developing yourself because, you know, if you're if you're, if you're doing the same things that you were doing, 
last week, you're the same person you were yesterday, then there's a problem. Correct. So I'm always trying to evolve. But my point is, is that, you know, when it comes to, you know, um, when it comes to this and it comes to, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, leadership or building a team, it's just really important that, you know, that I set the example and that uh, I um, I don't really focus on my, 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 my weaknesses. Right. I'd rather put a team around me. You know, if I spent time focusing on developing my weaknesses, bro, I wouldn't, I'd get nothing done. <laughs> Seriously, I'd get nothing done. Sure. I'd rather sit here. We talked about that this morning. How do we deliver content? I told you I felt the way we, you know, did a little bit of the education and training was, was wrong because, you know, um, it's focusing too much time on, 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 on things that are not my strengths. Correct. Memorizing cards, memorizing information, standing in front of a this organically allowing me to give a topic, spit on it, do what I need to do. And I mean spit like, you know, verbally, guys, not like right. oh, spit. So right, just right. but you know, to allow me to just flow. Uh, you know, it's just like putting yourself in the best position. But if you sit there and try to make yourself, you know, something that you're not, it's gonna come across on social media as not being authentic. And, uh, and it's going to waste a lot of time right. sitting there focusing on your weaknesses. So for me, it's like putting people strategically in place. It's a game of chess. It's not checkers. And it's strategically putting people in place to move the common goal forward. Right. So if, if, you, if you were um, looking to uh, become an owner-operator and ultimately you want to start managing properties, um, like you said, and then eventually you can take over ownership of other people's properties without putting your own money in, what are some of the types of team members that you should have in place? Like when you're managing your properties on a day-to-day basis, what are some of the team members that you're looking for? Uh, in the beginning, you know, for most people that are listening, it's going to probably be themselves. Yep. So it's, it's kind of really developing yourself and having a keen understanding of, of, of the accounting aspects uh, of the business, uh, the, the operational aspects of the business. You know, you're going to have to do all these things. You're, you know, the, you know, you're going to have to be well versed in property management. That's why anyone right. that comes into our programs, we teach them property management because that's the foundation. Right. And then asset management. So, you know, it's like understanding that. And then as you build your team and bring people around, you, you know exactly what pieces you need because Correct. you know what the big picture is. And so you'll say, OK, I don't like the bookkeeping. I bring in my accounting and my bookkeeping aspect. OK, uh, you know, I, I I need a good attorney, so, you know, this is who I'm going to gravitate towards. You know, I need, you know, so you start putting the pieces around you, but, you you know, you're going to, you, you'll, you'll, you'll see exactly what you need after you have a, a keen understanding of uh, of the basics and the fundamentals, which is property management. And even if, you know, uh, you know, yes, property management, if you're going to become a syndicator or you're going to own and operate your own apartment buildings, I don't care. You need to understand, you know, what it takes to operate those properties. So you need to have a strong understanding of, of the property management industry, and then you're able to build around that. Makes sense, man. Um, so we built a team. Uh, we got effective systems. We're professional. We're educated. Then in the book, you wrote that you should be managing your time properly. Um, how, are, how are people wasting time? Why is time management so valuable in, um, you know, managing assets? Um, you know, tell me more about why you put that in the book. Yeah. You know, I can't speak for everyone, you know, like, you know, what you're doing day to day, uh, you know, um, but if it's not pushing you towards your goal for the most part, then, 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 then it's taking away. Mm. So, you know, I can't speak to everyone cause I don't know what everyone's individual. All I know is if you're spending 45 minutes to an hour, um, looking and steering into your phone, playing games, uh, you know, delete that solitaire, delete that candy crush. You know, I was sitting next to a guy, you know, I think we were on the plane waiting to board somewhere and I'm, you know, I'm just glancing over. See, guys, you know, you know, we had a, a cocktail, you know, I glanced back over after we were about to close out our bill, still playing solitaire or, or, or candy crush. And again, I, I, you know, I'm not judging. I'm just simply saying there's gotta be a better use of your time. Everybody's got a goal. Everybody has a passion or something they're trying to work towards. Candy Crush ain't really, you know, that, that's, that's just not the path. That's right. not the, you know, you, you'll you never see me wasting time like that. So I can't tell you things that I'm not doing, you know. I won't tell you things that I'm not doing or implementing myself. But you you don't see me playing Candy Crush. You don't even come in getting into my car most most days and, and hear music. I haven't played music and I can't tell you how long. The only time I play music is usually classical or jazz to allow me to think. Right. Uh, but you always hear Gary V podcast. John Maxwell podcast, Joel Osteen, you know, um, 
know who he is now. Yep. But um, you know, uh, 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 training courses. You know, you know, you'll hear my finance courses. You'll hear the you know you know some sort of re- you know real estate related or, or course that I'm taking. Uh, it's because you know, listen, I don't you know. Music is great. I'm I'm all down with with the. I'd love to have Rick Ross booming and you know and and driving and you know I love to have a you know whatever. But really, I have to look at my time, you know, uh, and and how it's allotted. You know, I you know, I have that time between wherever I'm driving to to. I try to utilize it because I know when I get home, it's it's family time. I've got to put energy into my children, um, you know. So it's just really understanding how to maximize the time to push towards your goals. Cause that's how I can tell who's serious about exactly. the way they're, they're approaching their goals, how they set them and then how they approach them is, you know, I, I, I look at, you know, what you do and, 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 uh, you know, how do you, how do, how do you, um, how do you waste your time or how do you utilize your time? Exactly. We only have 24 hours in the day. So yeah. Um, less than that, less than that. You're, you're about sleeping right. bathroom yep. Yep. breaks or whatever. I mean, yeah, way less than that. That's a false narrative too, by the way. To sit there and think you got twenty four hours, you don't have twenty four hours. If you got a clean eleven, you're you're doing something. A clean eleven to seventeen, you're you're you know what I mean. So yeah, so you got less than that. Uh, here's here's something that I hear you say quite a bit, um, and this is actually one of the keys to becoming successful as a landlord or an asset manager: maximize income, minimize expenses. expenses. Mm-hmm. Why is that important, and why how does that make you successful? That's the goal. Okay. It makes you ses- successful because you're, you know, if you're maximizing income and minimizing expenses, you're, you, you've created the most value you can to the net operating income. And when you've created the most value you can to the net operating income, you've created the most value you can to the asset. Love it. Um, um, it, it for an example, for some of the listeners, what maybe could you explain a way that you've, um, you know, how do you maximize income um, and minimize expenses on a property? You don't necessarily have to go into too much detail, but you know, what are some things that people might be thinking about? You know, what does it look like? And, and, good question. And we and we talked about that. So yeah. if you remember when I said I stepped onto that 133 unit, Correct. I had my brother go and look at maintenance. Carlos went and looked at, you know, uh, delinquencies on the rent roll, looked at who was, you know, in trouble, who had a seven-day notice or where. I had uh, Ricky look at the renewals and find out where the market rents are, where, where our current rents are, the variances between the gross operating income and the effective income effective income look you know what are those variances that's how you maximize income minimize expenses you look at the rent starts with looking at the rent rolls starts with looking at the t12s t t3s and being able to look at okay you know at it at, at it's most simple right you know if most simplistic look at the gross operating income what i can effectively get if every unit was at at, at market rate and then the effective gross income, what you're actually collecting and what you're actually doing with your vacancies and all the things thrown in there and the difference. There is, I'm, I'm able to look at that and that variance tells me how you're operating as a property manager. And then I'm able to look at, and just clearly looking at the rent roll, you got 15, 20 people in a 133 unit apartment building that are constantly religiously late, two or three months delinquent, balance, you know, old, keeps carrying over month to month i see that there's you know there's deficiencies in the management in the systems so i knew you know and so there i may i'm able to uh you know to to kind of make a you know uh determination on uh you know on, on several fronts there we go there we go so maximizing income and minimizing expenses um another one you talk about is setting goals um i've heard you uh talk about things like um, making sure that you're getting a certain level of occupancy in your rentals as well as um, having a certain percentage of like on time rent collected. Uh, why is it important to, to take a look at those numbers and set the goals and actually work to achieve them? So why is that important? Uh, another good question for several reasons. I mean, you know, but again, trying to keep this simple, you, if you're a syndicator or even if you're a privately, just a, a, you know, a single operator, you own a rental property, a duplex or whatever, you're Johnny Vando and you, you have your duplex, right? Um, you got to maximize income. You got to minimize. You got to get the most value you can. This game is about getting the most value out of the asset, you know. Um, so you have to understand how to get the most value out of the asset. So being able to set those goals and looking at where, you know, as I stated, you know, gross operating income, what are the max rents you can get? You're never going to run at 100 percent occupancy. You're never going to run at a at a at a at that highest level. But, you know, being able to set that as your goal and as the measuring stick 
is key. Um, you know, so just, you know, you know, that, that that's where you start, you know, at the end of the day. But, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really, you know, again, looking at that, it's looking at the delinquencies, it's looking at the, uh, market rents. Um, it's evaluating your renewals. It's evaluating, you know, and, 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 you know, why, why maintenance for obvious reasons, maintenance has, you know, a major effect on the overall value of the property itself, how it, how it runs efficiently. But a lot of people, unless you're really in this industry for a long time, don't understand the correlation between maintenance right. and renewals and how important that is for renewals. Tenants are always going to throw up in your face. Oh, you want, you want this amount of rent, man. I just did a maintenance order and this person what look at LinkedIn or, 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 you know, these not LinkedIn, but these Yelps and things like that. You know, the, right. the biggest complaints you'll see about tenants is, is just simply ignoring work orders. Mm. So, you know, making sure that your your work orders are done on time in a timely fashion not only helps the property itself, but really is, you know, is a is a technique uh, for resident retention. Okay. So, you know, just just again, understanding all these aspects, man, is is and you know, you know, it, 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 we can go on. We can do a whole three, four hour show on this. We have. I've lectured Absolutely. eight hours yes. straight <laughs> on some of this of stuff. Course we have. Right? Yep. So, you know, yeah, man, it's, it's, you know, these, we're just scratching the surface, you know what I mean? But that's the wonderful thing about this podcast, bro. We're just scratching the surface on what we're trying to give our audience. Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's why, you know, this week I wanted to talk about um, seven keys to becoming a successful landlord. I, I really love that part of the book. Um, you know, it's at the very beginning, you know, and I think we need to talk about that. You know, everyone dreams of owning assets, but they don't necessarily think about, you know, the day to day and all the different things that come to uh, fruition when you're actually acquired, when you're managing these properties. Um, and B, um, once again, man, thank you for for taking the time to speak with me, man. It's always a pleasure having you in the studio, my brother. Always good to be here, man. And, um, and um, look forward to catching up with you next week. Um, Thank you guys for uh, listening to By the Block with Brian Chavis. Um, we've got um, visit brianchavis.com if you'd like to sign up for more education, more training, more development. You can hear some of our podcasts there. Uh, we've got our um, training program called the Multifamily Matrix as well, where you can be able to work one on one, not one on one, but group coaching with Brian Chavis. You can get the one on one too. One on one too. You want to pay for it. Absolutely. So we've got a great group training uh, set up for you. Um, tons of tools, tons of resources. And uh, once again, thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to speaking with you guys next week.